On today's episode of Secrets to Scaling Your E-Commerce Brand, I got a chance to chat with Izzy from Portless. We had such a good conversation about reimagining the way that fulfillment is done in 2023. We talked about all, sort of all about, you know, how the genesis of e-com has moved into such a way, a way that is incredibly, incredibly efficient, right? It's incredibly efficient, except on the fulfillment side of yeah, things, right? We move things like 10 or 12 times and it's not efficient. And I really think that Izzy might have actually solved this problem. I'm going to chat with him about this after the episode about you know how this could potentially work for a couple of our brands. And it's really, my mind is blown after having this conversation. Guys, you are not going to want to miss this episode. Hey guys, Jordan West back with another episode of Secrets to Scaling Your E-Commerce Brand. Today, I'm joined by Izzy Rosenzweig. No, I didn't get that right. Oh Lord, my God. It's perfect. <laughs> that right. We're going to keep this anyway. We're going to keep rolling here, guys. You know, cause if I had to stop every single time that I got a name wrong, we wouldn't have podcasts. You guys wouldn't have episodes. So That's we're going to keep going. We're going to go with Izzy from now on, just so we can do that. Keep Izzy from Portless. Welcome to the podcast. Super excited to be here, Jordan. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Looking forward to a great conversation today. We're going to be diving into a few sort of tactical items in here. Before we get into any of that kind of stuff, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you're doing in this space right now. Absolutely. So I I first started as a, a DDC brand. I was a DDC brand for about 10 years. The space that I played in as a consumer brand is what we call direct fulfillment. Essentially, shipping stuff by airmail near the factories, so in our case in China, directly thank consumers. When I started doing that 10 years ago, it wasn't very efficient. It was two to three week delivery, management on the tracking numbers, brought savings to the customer, but the experience wasn't great. However, the last two to three years, there's been more and more volume in this space. And because of that, the efficiency has gotten incredible. So we now have just under six business days to anywhere continent of the US and all with the local experience. So if let's just say you buy something on, on our website, within 24 hours, you have a USPS tracking number. It looks like it's pick packed in LA or New York, and it's delivered by a USPS driver six days later. So from a consumer perspective, they had the exact same experience as they had yesterday. But from us, again, when we were merchants, from our perspective, and now as Portless, we help you know tons of DTC brands leverage this model. It's game changing from a supply chain perspective. Okay, from I need to ask. I need to ask you a million questions when it comes okay. to this. This is it's funny because we were like guys. So sometimes what happens is my day is absolutely full of meetings, and this happens almost all the time. <laughs> and I just don't have time before to to do some research, right? My yeah. my assistant Noreen, who also edits this podcast, will come in, give me a few notes, and it's great. When Izzy said, you know, the way that we're talking about fulfillment is completely different than what merchants, yeah, no, he he was right. This is completely different. I need to know. I, I got to know about this. I got to know why. Like, I mean, it's, it's almost like drop shipping reimagined. Let's, let's dive in. Who owns the stock? Like, like where, why, why is the stock over there? Who owns it? Why would you have it over there? Why would you not move it all together over? I just got a billion questions for you. Yeah, so and I get it. I, I, to me, this is like where I get excited. So fundamentally, this space, I would say had a bad name. Never said, oh, you're doing drop shipping. The answer is no, it's not dropped. What people know are companies like AliExpress or people that would build websites, list a product, buy an Ali, drop ship to the customer. Now, fundamentally, that's not a great business model. And if we have time, we'll talk about in my consumer business, I did start in that world as an open marketplace. But fundamentally, why that wasn't a great business model is because when you drop ship and it's not your product, chances are the quality sucks. You don't control the, the brand experience, the yeah. product experience. The, pro the customer receives the product. The seller you're using is not incentivized the way you're incentivized as a brand. They just want to sell for the lowest cost possible. So yeah. you, what happened in so-called this space, people said, oh, drop shipping sucks. This whole industry must suck. So, the, so you got to split it apart. So drop thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Like drop shipping usually does suck. Fundamentally, because you're not controlling the brand quality. Yes. Now, think about brands. 40% of brands actually manufacture overseas, mostly in China. Apple, your iPhone is manufactured mostly in China by Fox. Yeah. So really the brand is- You also cannot do most of this stuff over here. Just you everybody knows. Without these own accounts, materials are over there. Like, yeah, totally. Like I, I think of, I, I just want to give a couple examples here. Yeah. So like, I think of like the companies that we run in the apparel space. There is one mill in Canada. It's just outside yeah. of Toronto. 
And yeah. their costs are three X what we pay importing and yeah. after all fees and everything from China. It's just impossible. I cannot, we cannot make money yeah. by using a Canadian mill. It's just not possible. It's as though we have zero of, of fabric manufacturing in Canada. We 100%. have more. So does that everybody else. Yeah. Like with most of the things, we don't, just don't have the capabilities of doing it. So when a company is like, oh, I, we, you know, we make all of our stuff overseas, you don't need to judge them. There's a lot of times they can't even do it over here. So 100%. And, yeah. and I'll, I'll go at a little bit of a tangent for a second. My family actually used to be manufacturing for about 60 years. We oh, used, cool. Yes. We used to own a factory in Toronto. Like my grandfather started it. Yeah. You know, came after the Holocaust, lost his family, started from nothing and built a factory business in Toronto. Wow. And what happened was between the early 50s and the 80s, lots of factories in Toronto. Again, the cost of a dress was like four or $500. Then all of a sudden, containers became standardized in, in the 1980s. All of a sudden, there was efficiency in bringing products overseas. Yeah. Some factories evolved and said, hey, I see around the corner. This is the future. Why? Same or better quality product. All the raw materials came from overseas. So instead of bringing raw materials to Canada and then do manufacturing with machines that aren't that sophisticated, you keep the raw materials where they are. You do sophisticated manufacturing. Consumer wins. The consumer always has to win. As long as you're doing, you're using good factories and all, all the great processes. If the consumer wins, that's the end game here. Great quality product, great pricing. And so in the 1980s, what happened was most of those factories went bankrupt. My grandfather went very niche, high end and, and specific sizing, or some factories evolved. The ones that pivoted did extremely well. The ones that didn't and try to like say, no, 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 well, they're no longer in business, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, to me, and, and no one was upset about it. It made sense. It made sense. Consumer has to win, same or better quality, and really giving that customer a great experience. And they have just the, the raw materials are there and great factories to deliver it. So back to the, the, this idea is, to your point, the, the brand owns the quality. Now, what is this model? It's all about logistics. So in traditional supply chain, if you were Walmart building a store, you must make 5,000 t-shirts, put it on a boat, bring it into the US. You're bringing, because you're bringing bulk, you're paying import duties, it's, it's above $800 value. You're bringing yeah. it to your 3PL or you're bringing it to your warehouse and you're putting it on the shelf. That's traditional supply. Cost of goods, you know, 30, 60, 90 days waiting to turn inventory to cash. Yeah. And if something does well, well, you missed the season, you got to wait till next year. Yeah. Uh, that's just traditional supply chain. In this model, again, if you own the quality, because you're responsible as a brand to own the quality, but being that fulfillment is right next to the factories, you can massively reduce your inventory needs. You could turn inventory to cash in days, not months, days. Yeah. Production, it's in a fulfillment center. And then you're getting it delivered to your customer in six days. Guys, so this, this is actually life-changing for brands. Like I think about the amount of like, you know, one of our brands alone, I am holding $1.7 million of inventory right now in fabric wow. and in finished goods, yeah. right? Like that's going to be a good half year turnaround, three, three month, three yeah. to four months. Turnaround. I mean, with this economy in Canada right now, probably longer, it's very difficult. Yeah. I, yeah. You know, we're very, you know, you guys might think I'm like super loaded, but <laughs> 0.7 million in just sitting there that isn't cash is actually a really big deal to us. Yeah, and, that's a and, lot of money. It's, and yeah. well, there's, if you're financing it, interest is expensive. Uh, inventory to cash, it, it all adds up. And, and, and I was a merchant. I, I was in the same boat, right? Yeah. And when we went to this model for ourselves, scaling became different because it used to be you stop and go. You do well, you got your money, you repurchase. Yeah. Then you do well again. You got, and it's constant, like you're going, you're stopping, you're going, you're stopping. But imagine if you could do that where your, your cash isn't an inventory. You're kind of producing two weeks or three weeks ahead of demand, not six months. Because mm -hmm. once done production, two days later, pick packing and shipping it. Yeah. You know, it really is game changing. And, and, you know, I lived it too, right? Like I lived it as a brand and, and as a merchant. And it was life changing from a castle perspective and, and, and business from a business and economics perspective. And well, that's just in the cash flow. Yeah. You know, totally. Let's, let, let's get back in there. Is he, you're, you're going to find it's just a, a random conversation back and forth all the time. I love, it. I love to just hop in as yeah. these things come up because I think I'm, I'm just pretty mid. I'm just the kind of guy that like, asks them the same questions probably everyone else is thinking right now. What about the costs? Like there's got to be, so yeah, sure. You've got it down to six days, but like, you know, DHL three day or four day DHL for a small package is like 40 bucks. How do you make those unit economics work? Um, yeah, great question. Yeah. So fundamentally, the, when you think of shipping, 
there's three parts of shipping. There's the pickup, movement from one distribution center to another distribution center, and then again, last mile. Yeah. First mile, mid mile, last mile. In our model, first mile and mid mile don't, doesn't happen in, America, in the US, happens overseas. So when you're having someone pick up in your warehouse, that person is making $800,000 a year to pick up. Then you got to move it again. And then you're doing from LA to San Diego. And our model is we take all the products packages, we sort it in advance, we're buying space on planes, and then we're injecting it into the closest location next to the customer. So if you're in San Diego, we're not injecting in New York, we're injecting it in, in, in LA. So we're paying USPS less. So let's give an example, a half a pound for like just under six bucks, five dollars and 80 something cents. We have it delivered anywhere in continental US. And from a, 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 an experience perspective, it's a $1 pick and pack for up to three units. Every unit above is 25 cents. Shipping on the lighter end is very affordable. So apparel is perfect for this model. And from a warehousing perspective, we say, think of your inventory differently. If you can move your inventory in 60 days, there is no warehousing fees. We won't charge you warehousing fees. We want you to think of inventory very differently than traditional supply chain. So those are the only three charges we do. And, and, and just to add a little more benefits here, so A, there's a whole different understanding of cash flow. B, and I think in apparel, your import duties is somewhere between 20 and sometimes even higher percent. If this pattern, no, de, de, that's depending on, we, we actually import fabric and then make in Canada. Uh, oh, I think fabric right. comes in for free. Got but, it. Um, yeah. Not free. Got it. The fabric isn't free. Yeah, yeah, no. So the import duties is less, but yeah. in some from the, from the US perspective, you're looking at 20% duties or higher. But yeah. if you're shipping it directly to the end customer, if the value of goods is under $8, it's actually duty free. And then also the container costs go away. So you're looking at shipping rates rather competitive for lightweight stuff, savings on import duties, savings on container costs, a, a cost effective three, let's call it warehousing pick and pack costs. Yeah. And the last angle of this is globalization, right? When a lot of people want to do business in the UK or, or Canada or US, you're sending containers all over the place. In yeah. our model, you have one inventory hub in, our, in Shenzhen, let's say with us, and we have virtual, you could look at it as virtual 3PLs in all these countries. Because if some from the UK buys from you, shop by markets, Toronto, UK, Royal Mail, Australia, Australia Post, Canada, Canada Post, US, USPS, and so on and so on. So there's this ability to be way more agile in your inventory, access all these markets, which have cheaper CPMs, cheaper CPCs. And it really is just gives you an edge in this difficult game of DTC. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is the, this is the, the crazy thing. So where do you have all of these different pick and pack locations over there? Does it matter where in China specifically they are? Um, as no, far so as the really manufacturer doesn't make a difference to us. Our main hub is Shenzhen. So in really moving inventory within China is very affordable. You can move, let's say, 5,000 t-shirts, like 100 bucks across China. It usually takes two to three days to get to us. So let's say your production is done on a Monday. By Thursday, we're actually shipping it to your customer. Yeah. So your and inventory right goes Shen Shenzhen is where where everyone in apparel manufactures, so. <laughs> well, I, I think China's very big, but Shenzhen is, yeah. is a big free trade yeah. zone. So. Uh, one of, it is one of the places, anyway. Shenzhen yeah. is big. I think all its Sonics is big in Shenzhen as well. There's a lot of free trade zones next to Hong Kong, so there's a lot of business going in in Shenzhen. But yeah, it, it, it really changes the game for these brands. Oh, so yeah, you can move. Inventory has takes two, three days. You're done production on a Monday morning. You don't need to wait to fill up container. You can send 10 boxes, you can send five skids. And then we're receiving it by Wednesday, Thursday. You've sold it on your website because now you can list it. And then that inventory that you just made turns to cash that quick. Wow. And, and there's like a, you're talking about a six day guarantee anywhere in the continental US. It's not guaranteed, it's our average. We've seen yeah. three deliveries. I, the, the trajectory of this business is three to four days. We see already three to four day deliveries happening because go on planes every day. And then it gets injected yeah. next to the customer. But right now, the average is six business days. Do you see companies doing a, a hybrid model? Yep. So if you're doing, let's just say wholesale, or you want a portion of your business to be like next day delivery, and we know a lot of our customers have like five to 10% of the full expense. So what we'll, we'll do is they'll bring some inventory locally, again, a much lower inventory, much less cash in inventory, and to, to fill, let's say, bulky orders, which is not good for our model, or to fulfill express delivery options. So we do see people do a mix. Okay, that, that makes sense. Is he, do you have any case studies of brands who have moved from the North American model over to this, this other model? And I, I think that here's some of the things that I'm concerned about. Number one, yep. reviews. Number two, NPS score. 
Number three is, is the actual brand experience yep. um, in all of this. Number four is like, hey, you know, what happens when my customer sees a package coming from China? Yep. And, they think, and they're like, well, you said you're an ethical manufacturer. You said this, yep. like, well, how does that work? Yeah. So first of all, we are, we were a brand for 10 years. So we, when we say a three pill experience run by a, a, a company that did, that shipped millions of products for ourselves. We, yeah. we ship over 2 million products, orders in our own business. So for us, a brand experience is everything. So everything from packaging, custom boxes, custom labels, recycle options, honeycomb options. We help our customers get access to any type of packaging that makes sense for them. Cool. And to make it look really nice. If, if you're in the gifting space, you know, red paper wrapped around every single order. We yeah. will facilitate that. And then from a, an experience, there is no Mandarin. It is all USPS tracking numbers. So a customer makes an order. All they see is a USPS tracking number. It looks very, it looks the same if, if you're yesterday in New Jersey and tomorrow by us, it's the same experience. USPS tracking number. You don't see any China on that USPS tracking number. Within one day, it's working tracking number, deliver six days later. So from what comes from, so, so the USPS tracking number would come from, say, you know, say you're in Santa Barbara, it's going to come from LA. Exactly. Because what we're doing is we'll have the track, it's USPS tracking and USPS says product and route to our facility. And then two days later, it's injected to their facility in LA because we put on a plane pre-label ready for injection. So it's really the exact same experience. There isn't any Mandarin anywhere. You don't see it came from China. It's local experience. And the same thing with their customer in London, UK. You make a transaction, it's Royal Mail. Within one day, it's injected into the Royal Mail system. So it's all local experience. You could go anywhere from honeycomb packaging with your logo on it to just regular non-branded, but it doesn't feel any different if you're with us versus you're in New Jersey. How, what kind of brands does this not make sense for? Because this is yep. really compelling, especially yep. because I'm thinking about, so as a Canadian, right? I've, I both own companies down in the States and up here. Our shipping rates down in the States are more, our average shipping rate is more than what you're saying. From- yep. For a half a pound? Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. like, well, we don't pay USPS the full price. We get better rates. We only do a, a third of their mile, right? Yeah. It do, I'll tell you where it doesn't make sense. As the product gets bulkier and heavier. Okay. If it gets bulky and heavy, then buying space in airplanes makes less sense. Yeah. Their own jewelry, cosmetics, accessories, all this stuff is great. Bulky, heavy, no longer makes sense for this model. Gotcha. Gotcha. This, I'm also thinking about, sorry guys, my mind is really spinning with all of this. Cool. I, you know, sometimes when you hear an idea and you're like, yeah, why did I not think of that? I actually, one of my good friends who runs a shoe company and just outside of Vancouver here as well, was telling me about wanting to do this. And I'm like, you're crazy. I'm like, that's is not it, a is it the kid's shoe company by any chance. What's that? Is it a kid's shoe company or? or yeah, yeah, we won't bring them up in case okay. you chat with them. I but, think we're well, discussions. Okay, let's. Um, Let's get, let's get this discussion off offline after, because I'm, I'm very interested to oh, hear yeah. about this. Cause when he yeah. told me about it, I said, that's a really stupid idea. Yeah. And, and I totally and get I'm like, right. And that's, and that's the perception of so many people. And what, yeah. you, what you don't realize is, is there's a lot of brands that differ themselves. You know, Quincy, familiar with Quincy. It's like a yeah. high premium. They, they use this model, premium product, same experience. Wow. So, so really the brand quality is up to the brand. The yeah. logistics running Running a digital business by using a 1980 supply chain doesn't make sense. And to me, again, when my grandfather starts in the 1980s and I grew up, you know, during that time, during that transition, I'm like, you know, you could have seen the curve, but you either went niche or you went out of business. Yeah. And my end is if you're in digital and you don't need products on a shelf, it just doesn't make sense. Why would you bring it all over, wait 60 days just to ship it again locally and have all these added steps and all these people touching your product? When there's efficiency in putting stuff on planes at scale, sorting them in advance and injecting them as close to the customer as possible, everyone wins. You can make more money. You can invest in your business. Use that cash for hiring, for marketing. There's I mean, you're thinking about experimentally too, right? Yep. I mean, you're just filling up space on planes that are planes that are going anyways. Exactly. Yeah. And 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 you touch is less thing. Less trucks are touching it. Less warehousing. All that need for warehousing. It's factory, right to consumer, everything else from our perspective is extra. Unless you're physical retail. In that case, you need it. Part of the model. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. But then, and then you can hybrid it too. Exactly. Right. Exactly. That's the, that's the beautiful thing. Izzy, how did you get on my podcast? I am <laughs> logging this conversation so much. And this, like, 
it is actually like, again, when my friend told me about this model, I'm like, not going to work. No, <laughs> no, it was a horrible idea. And now that you've, now that you've explained it to me, it makes so much yeah. sense. And, and we get that reservation. The first thing we do talk to people is like, give me your address. Let me ship it to you. You'll experience it as a customer. We'll send you some portless notebooks. So we got some swag in your, in your building. Yeah. Uh, but then you experience it and you're like, holy crap, this is wild. This is a wild experience. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is what I, what I want. Izzy, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of just keep that wrapped up right there. I think that that's really beautiful. And I think that people are going to see a ton from this. I want to throw something out there that's really interesting before I ask Izzy the question I ask everyone. Really interesting thing that happened to me and that I, I'm not going to do a whole episode on it, but I want SaaS people out there to know, because I know a lot of you SaaS people are listening to this podcast, went to go cancel a subscription for a tool that uh, we're using on the agency side, which costs us around 4000 US a month. You know, it's a pretty decent cost, even mm -hmm. though we're a fairly big size agency. We looked at it. Our staff just weren't using it. Went to cancel. When I went to cancel, I was met with a, uh, a pop-up that said, you must book a call to cancel. and. Mm. And so I, so I put that out on Twitter. I, about half an hour ago, it had reached 400,000 people already. And people are so wow. ridiculously mad about it because yeah. this is not the way to do business. So I, 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 I'm just throwing this into the Izzy episode here because I want you guys to know that kind of thing. And I, I did not name them because I actually really like them. And I think that they're just incredible people. Yeah. Uh, and I love their service. Our staff just weren't using it. And I didn't want to name them because I don't want their business to absolutely tank, especially with that kind of reach out there. But please know that these things matter to your customers. So like, you know, D2C brands, this matters, right? These kind of, these little things that we do really matter. How you decide to let somebody cancel. So if you're running a subscription, I don't think Recharge would ever let you do that or any of those companies out there. Do not make it hard for people to let, let them make their own decisions. We can see how mad people get about this and how yeah. Your brand will absolutely tank SaaS people, agency people, just make it ridiculously easy for people yeah. to be able to leave if they're not. The last thing you want to do is jump on a call with a sales guy to try to convince you on a decision you already knew. Like, it's ridiculous. Well, okay. I already know. Like, I know what the call is. It's not like, yeah, like I know you're just going to try and retain my business. And I'm like, <laughs> we're not using it. Why would I want to pay for it? I don't want to pay a dollar for it That's if I'm not using it. So. Anyway, just wanted to throw that one in there, guys, because I think it's a really valuable lesson for all of us that these little things that we do to to sort of maximize profit and maximize revenue can actually tank our business. 100%. And, yeah. It and shows on the brand. It kind of shows the, the the style of the brand. And like, do you want to work with a brand like that? So totally, yeah. totally. Yeah. I mean, that's one one big thing here, like because the sort of I hold the CEO title at our agency here. And one of the big things that I tell people if I ever hop on on sales calls with them. So I'm like, we don't do contracts. The reason we don't do contracts is because I know you're going to stay with us. The average person stays with us for like 18 months at upgrowth. I'm nice. like, why? Like, why? And in the agency world, just so everyone knows that's unheard of for sure. <laughs> but, but this is like, this is why we do this. I'm like, you want to cancel? Go ahead and cancel tomorrow. Yeah. I don't care. I don't want to work with you if you're not happy. Yeah. And if it's a rough net or you're not bringing enough value, then you shouldn't be here anyways. We Talk do the same thing. We have no commitments. Use us. We'll invoice you. You don't use us. Great. We don't yeah. need to invest you. Totally. Uh, and that's, that's very difficult for, for owners to understand. Another really interesting split test one of my buddies just did recently was lowering its free shipping threshold from, from 100 down to 49. His AOV has gone up 30%. Huh. I so it was think more, it was a more of attainable AOV. Well, it, it's what I'm wondering is, is, so first of all, his new customer rate has gone up 3x since he did hmm. that. Secondly, his AOV has gone up during that time. And what I think that it is psychologically is that customers don't want to be bullied into doing something that they don't want to do. Mm. They just don't. They want to make their own decisions. Sweet, $49 free shipping. I'm going to add a few more things anyway while I'm at it. But the brand's not making me do it, right? Whereas I think people sometimes have that same sort of feeling with these free shipping thresholds. Yeah. Just something to throw out there. Anyway, this is a, a huge tangent. Izzy, I'm going to ask you the question I ask everyone who comes on the podcast. What is your secret to scaling? Secrets and great question. Uh, when we were scaling our consumer business, for us, it was two parts. One was the ability to scale on a linear level, meaning not to stop and go and not have hit with cash flow problems or get hit with out of stock. And we had to wait to next season to make that work. That was a massive advantage for us. And then B for us was really understanding our data. So when stuff in marketing work, and like I'm sure you're you know, running a business and, and marketing agency, you know, really well, is attribution, making sure attribution is perfect. Is it 
which image in the ad, which ad set in the ad set? Is it what age range or what device? To me, like getting really deep in devils and the devil is in the details. Because if you miss attribution wrong and you think it's Clavio, not Facebook or Facebook versus Clavio, you have the wrong math and you could be burning a ton of money. So I think for us, you know, getting the data right, the attribution right, and have the ability to scale evenly just through a capital perspective was, was a big advantage for us. Awesome. Awesome. I absolutely love that. Izzy, I got three more questions for you. I hope that you're ready. Oh, yeah. Right, right. Okay. First one, favorite tool or app that you're using right now? Uh, I think post iOS 14, I'd say probably Triple Whale and Fondue. Those are the two big ones. We know the Fondue guys. Right. Giving, ca- giving, <laughs> and giving so, Exactly. We know Oren very well. <laughs> but but we, love, we love his app as well, right? We, we've known his app before we knew Oren. Fondue from a different way, a different way of looking at discounts was huge for us. And then attribution from Triple Whale, just getting that data dead right. Yeah, yeah, I, absolutely. Again, guys, you know that I'm a huge Triple Whale fan over here. We have used them. There was a time where I was their number one affiliate. I guess I got to talk, yeah. start talking about them a little bit more because I absolutely love them. And yeah, I mean, only number one affiliate because I love them. That's the only reason. Yeah. So yeah. I just haven't given out my link enough. So recently <laughs> I just talk about them instead. Uh, second question for you, favorite podcast or audio book that you're listening to? I would say, I mean, in general, I love Lex Freeman as a podcast and general podcast for DDC space. How I made my first million. Love those guys. I love yeah. That's that a great podcast. podcast. But for me, I try to like dabble everywhere. If I see a good podcast and a good title and a good topic, I'll jump in, even if it's not like a podcast or I usually listen to. That's great. It's really interesting. I've, I've always in, in my life really tried to balance both sides of things, especially as Canadians. We're pretty, you know, yeah. politically, we're, you know, and ideologically pretty, pretty far on the left side of things. And there's actually not a ton on the other side, Canadian wise, that, that really is out there unless you kind of go on the wacky side of things. And so something that I've really tried to do is listen to these people that have these incredible voices out there that are a little bit different than mine, like, you know, Rogan and Lex, like both those guys have a really good perspective on how to actually ask questions and how to really dive into really sensitive, difficult to talk about subjects. Yeah. And, and And they're just very curious. They're curious people, which is why it's so enjoyable. Totally. Totally. I mean, I, uh, yeah, I could go down a whole rabbit trail of talking about, I love just listening to Rogan's DMT experiences. Those yeah. are some favorite things. Not, uh, anyway, thanks. by the way, somebody recently sent me some psilocybin microdose pills. Not sure who you were. I've highly appreciated. <laughs> and, but, and, and the amount of different things that people send me this week. Thank you, everyone who's sending me That's different so things. Funny. I am not confirming or denying whether or not I'm going to use any of these products, <laughs> not, but thank you, no matter what. <laughs> Last question for you is you just found out you have a year to live. What changes? Oh, wow. For me, I travel a lot for work, but I love traveling. I'd probably do more traveling that isn't related to work. Or at least I had a minimum blend in, right? Yes. So big traveler, love that things are open now and uh, love that. I'll probably do that. More yeah. Consistent. Sweet. That's, that's great. An interesting one with that question that, that's come up. And sorry, I, I don't normally talk quite as much to everyone who's listening to this. They're like, yes, you do. But but a really interesting, and I forget who this who this artist is, but his videos have been popping up for me so much recently. And and a lot of them are like, it's like this cartoony video. The first one that I saw was called Happiness. And it's just this phenomenal look at what is wrong with the way that we live our lives right now mm-hmm. and how like the happiness one is all about these. It's all, all about these rats that just go on living their lives in the rat race, right? And all of these different things that we do and that we think that we're just going to attain this certain thing and then you know, and then it's, and then we really realize in the end, like, I think he grabs the money and then just gets killed. And it's like, and what a useless uh, way to live our lives. And so I, I love thinking about this question every time I ask, and I think about it for myself as well. And lots of times the diamond turns a little bit for me and I'm like, oh yeah, you know, there's a couple of things in in my life right now that are, that are really just about survival rather than actually living a great life. So Izzy, thanks for your time today. Thanks for, thanks for chatting. What a phenomenal olive branch that this could potentially be. And sorry, lifeline, I think is actually the right word that I'm thinking of for brands that are sitting on, you know, $1.7 million of inventory and just wondering why the heck, how the heck this happened. Is, well, uh, I, I know someone. <laughs> so thank you so much. Where can people connect with you and then find out more about Portless? Yeah, absolutely. So to find out more about Portless, go to portless.com. You reach out to us there. We'll get back to you right away and love to hear more about your business and see if we can help you. But for me, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter. Love those two spaces. 
you DM me there, I'll definitely get back to you. And I always try to post interesting content, at least for areas that I love, which is supply chain. Awesome. Awesome. Absolutely love it. Thank you again so much for your time today. Guys, remember all of the things that Izzy and I talked about today will be down in the show notes, any links or anything like that. The connections to him also will be down there. So please, please check out the show notes. We do a lot of work on those. And again, I appreciate everybody who listens to this so much. Thanks so much. 